All right, hello, hello, hello. And welcome to the Breaking Down Barriers uh, Black and Latinx Pre-Nursing Conference. My name is Aaron King and I'm secretary for the Capital City Black Nurses Association. Before I go on too much further, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors for this conference. So Betty Irene Moore School of Nurses, Nursing's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and UC Davis Health. Um, their continued support has made this event and many others possible. Uh, so big thank you. Um, we have tried to work to uh, make navigation very easy. So we have compiled um, a schedule in one place and I will pop that link in the chat shortly um, to, so that you will be able to access the different breakout rooms. You'll be able to leave and uh, you'll be able to come in and exit as you wish um, and listen to the amazing panelists that we have. Um, so I will be dropping that in the chat shortly. Um, now I would like to take a, a second to introduce uh, Carter Todd, president and co-founder of Capital City Black Nurses Association to tell you a little bit more about our organization. Go ahead, Carter. Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. We're gonna be letting everyone in as they roll into the conference. I just wanna say welcome on behalf of Capital City Black Nurses Association over here in Sacramento, California. We're truly honored that you're deciding to spend a little bit of time on your Saturday with us. We know how important that is, not just to you all, but to us as well. Um, a little history about our organization is we were founded in 2018 we were small but mighty initially. Um, Aaron, who's putting on this event, he probably won't tell you how uh, pivotal he's been to this conference uh, this weekend and bringing together the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, Sacramento, and Capital City Black Nurses Association. But a huge thank you to Aaron King. I'm going to give him a round of applause before I move forward. Um, and we're going to have a lot of great speakers today. So stay with us. Take some breaks. You're going to get a lot of information. Um, and I'm probably going to be the least buttoned up from this whole event. We have some really renowned, um, high achieving nurses, leaders, and they look like us. They sound like us. It's really important. I mean, when I was going and trying to become a nurse, I wish we had something like this. So I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. And Aaron, I'm truly honored and excited to be here, my friend. Thank you so much. I would now, uh, uh, in addition to our sponsors, this event was made possible through partnership, as Carter mentioned, um, with the Sacramento chapter of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. So I'd like now to introduce Sandra Calderon. Uh, she's president and founder, oh, of course my mom's calling, <laughs> president and founder of Sacramento Non to tell you a little bit more about her organization. Go ahead, Sandra. Well, thank you so much. Um, so excited to be here with everybody. Like Carter said, I know it's hard for everybody to kind of get up on a Saturday, but I appreciate everybody's time and effort. Um, I first want to start off by thanking Capital City Black Nurse Association for joining forces. Uh, Carter, Aaron, all the members have been amazing in kind of bringing us in together. Shout out to Aaron. He's been pivotal at getting this together, leadership, commitment. Um, so thank you so much, Aaron. This has been really amazing. Um, so our Hispanic, um, National Hispanic Nursing Association kind of started around 2019 with the help of Dr. Mary Lou de Leon Science. So she was actually one of the founding members of NON, and she was one of our national presidents. She's an emeritus professor at UC Davis, Betty Every Moore School of Nursing. So very excited to have her with us. Um, you know, I came to this country undocumented. Um, my family and I, um, we received amnesty and I became a, a US citizen when I was 19 years old. So anybody on the call that's undocumented or DACA, I just wanna let you know that anything's possible for you, don't give up. And if you um, ever need any information about that, please don't hesitate to join us. Um, so without any further ado, I wanna introduce to you our national um, association president, Dr. Adriana Nava. A little bit about Dr. Nava. She's currently a chief quality nurse um, at the Edward Hines VA Hospital. Um, Dr. Nava serves, again, our Latino community by being our national president. She's focused on build, building leadership capacity for nurses with a focus on Latino nurses who continue to be underrepresented, as most of you know, in our healthcare leadership and different positions around the country. Um, Dr. Nava has an MPA 
uh, from Harvard Kennedy School. She has a PhD in health policy from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She has an MSN in healthcare leadership from the University of Pennsylvania, BSN from St. Francis Medical Center College of Nursing. Um, her research interests include health equity, access to primary care, and workforce development. So thank you so much, Dr. Nava, for being here with us. And um, okay, we're all set for you. Great, thank you for the warm introduction and good morning to the future of nursing. I'm so happy to be here and speak to all of you today. And I'm deeply honored that we're talking today about breaking down barriers during this conference. And this is a critical time to be holding this conference since we know there's additional stressors and barriers that are being added to the daily lives of nursing students and all of yours across the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And during the pandemic, we know that about 25% of students have postponed college due to COVID. And we know that as these barriers continue to accumulate, they disproportionately affect Black and Hispanic students. And that's why this nursing conference that's focused on pre-nursing students is important because we're not only acknowledging the longstanding barriers that affect minority students, but this conference is the opening to discussions for students to understand how to learn from the past, how to make changes in the present, and how to be active participants in the future. This timely discussion would not be possible without the creativity and dedication of the Capital City Black Nurses Association, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses Sacramento chapter, and of course, UC Davis. So thank you all for bringing us together to elevate and discuss the importance of representation in the nursing profession. And when I step back and think about representation in the nursing profession, what does this mean to me? My first thought is leadership. No matter your political affiliation, how inspiring was it to see Vice President Kamala Harris win her election? She was moving into a national position of executive leadership where we have never seen another woman and much less a woman of color do so. And now we know that that could be us. And for all of you, future nursing leaders, that will be you. You will be the first nurse or the first black nurse or the first Hispanic nurse to accomplish many things. And I can't wait to see it. But these accomplishments happen in steps and an acknowledgement and understanding of the barriers that black and Hispanic nursing students face on their leadership journeys. Some questions to consider during this conference while you guys are all participants is, what first, what are the biggest challenges that Black and Hispanic students are facing today and how do we overcome them? And second, what opportunities and innovations can we create for the future nursing workforce? Now I wanna take a moment to turn to what Nan has been doing since you know, I became the president and adding all of the knowledge and skills of all our members and the work that they've done in the past. As an organization, we have taken our own leadership journey with a focus on developing non-national healthcare leaders. And when we speak about national healthcare leaders, what exactly do we mean? I mean, how do we help develop our members to be next, next elected officials when they're serving in Congress or the Senate, or even being elevated to presidential appointments in the White House? As an organization, we have an opportunity to elevate and motivate our members to be national decision makers. I know this is not a traditional trajectory for nurses, but it's a very important one. If we want to play a major role in shaping our healthcare system of the future, we need a pathway to national leadership positions. We need to create those steps. And when our nurses are in these positions, they will be in positions to break down barriers for others to follow. Now this vision, is one that Jim Collins, the author of the book, Good to Great, would call a big, hairy, audacious goal. According to Jim Collins, we must define our destiny in broad but clear terms. A big, hairy, audacious goal is one that engages people and grabs them by the gut. People get it right away and it takes little to no explanation. This is our big, hairy, audacious goal because it may take 30 years or more to make it. And historically, we've seen a Hispanic leadership gap and it's been identified in many sectors, including healthcare. And I even know in my own leadership journey, many people are surprised to see a Latina in high levels of leadership. And I'm sure this is true for many of you in your current workplaces. Given our current social and economic environment, it's clear to see why we need to develop non-national healthcare leaders. We are living in a brand new world. How many nurses or healthcare professionals today can raise your hand and say that we've lived through a global pandemic? None of us. 
And on top of this new normal, we have recently faced civil unrest, and we continue to witness racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare making headlines across the country as if it was new. But we as Latino and Black nurses and as organizations that focus on these issues have known for years that these disparities have existed and have taken it upon ourselves throughout the years to address them. So here we are today, together on August 21st. How do we go forward? How do we do better? How do we reach our big, audacious, hairy goal of making national nursing leaders? To begin this journey, we need to increase our knowledge base of national healthcare policies and how these policies impact the communities we serve. This is an essential function of leadership. As we build upon our ability to influence health policy nationally, we are also building our skill sets to influence policies at the state level, at the community level, and within the healthcare organizations where we work at every single day. We at NON are currently reinvigorating our national policy committee and our local leadership curriculum for chapter presidents to focus on teaching them current national health policies and how these policies impact Latino health. One of the most remarkable health policy actions that was taken recently in our time was the passage of the 2010 Patient Care Affordable Care Act. This legislation focused on improving access to care for low-income individuals between the ages of 18, 60, 18 to 64 with the expansion of Medicaid and an insurance subsidy option. As we know, having insurance is important as it's a means to access the healthcare system where we as nurses work in every day. We know when people are uninsured, they often rely on the safety net health centers or an organization such as NAN to provide health education and screening in the community setting. We know that having inadequate access to care, being uninsured and being unlikely in, to get your healthcare needs met is a reason that we see our Latinos and other minority uh, populations being severely disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Dr. Fauci called the disparities that the Latino community was facing an extraordinary problem. And he recommended our community receive adequate testing and immediate access to care. He went on to say that this is not something we can fix in a month or a year, but requires a decades long commitment to change. For the health of our community, we as NAN need to be the leaders leading this change. I know I focused on the future of NAN and where we are going moving forward, but I wanna close my remarks on what non-members and pre-nursing students can do for our community now. If you haven't heard, this month is Civic Health Month and NAN has proudly partnered with Voter ER and Civic Health Month to encourage healthcare professionals across the country to become civically engaged. This first step is one for you to have a voice and make sure that you are registered to vote so that you can stay informed of key policy decisions that are happening in your community. When you vote, you have a voice and you play a key role in improving the future for ourselves and for the future of the communities that we serve. So thank you again to Non Sacramento, Capital City Black Nurses Association and UC Davis for bringing us all together today. I look forward to continuing to work with you all in the coming years as we build the nursing workforce's capacity to overcome barriers and reach national levels of leadership in the United States. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Nava. As the, as the kids say, yes, yes. <laughs> that is the energy that we need this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to provide these uh, opening remarks. Um, Let's show some love for Dr. Nava in the chat and throw some emojis for her. She did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Now I would like to take the time to introduce one of our keynote speakers. Dr. Piri Ackerman Barger is the Associate Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, as well as an Associate Clinical Professor at the University of California, Davis, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. She serves as a researcher for the Center for, Diverse, for a Diverse Healthcare Working to diversify health professions pipeline. She also directs faculty development for education and co-directs the interpersonal teaching scholars program for UC Davis Health. Over her career, Dr. Ackerman has combined her expertise in nursing and education to advance a program for instruction on workplace diversity, education equity, 
and institutional stability, uh, stability, sustainability. I am truly fortunate to have her as a research chair, mentor, and friend. It is now my honor to welcome Dr. Kapiri Ackerman Barger, founding member of CCBNA, as our keynote speaker for the Breaking Down Barriers Conference. Thank you, Aaron. Hello, everyone. Thank you to Cap City Black Nurses Association and our local chapter of NON. Uh, thank you, Adriana Nava, for joining us today. I don't know if you remember, but we met uh, a little while back with the Campaign for Action. So I am super happy to be with everybody today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. Give me just a sec here to get my view all ready. Um, Aaron, just give me a thumbs up. Can you see my screen? Can you see it? In, okay, awesome. Um, so what I would like to do today is um, talk about passion in nursing and uh, sort of like where we've been, where we are, and where we can go as a profession. Um, in this image here, you're looking at the hospital simulation lab at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Um, in this image, we are simulating a code blue. So just a, a little sample of some of the things we do at our school. So I, I want to start with this idea that passion is biographical, right? Each and every one of you have brought some sort of your history and experiences in the world to your interest in nursing. And, you know, in many ways, our interests will be different. Uh, they don't have to be the same. But when I ask people, what, why did you think of nursing? What was the impetus for you to think of nursing as a profession? And usually people say something like, I want to be of service to other people. I want to help communities. So that's a commonality. But the way that we got here is a little bit different. I won't spend too much time talking about myself, but I am gonna just share a little bit of my passion in nursing. Um, you're looking at a photograph of my parents. Um, this was a little bit before I was born in the late 60s. Um, my mom is white, my dad is black. I identify as a mixed race individual. And um, they broke up when I was pretty early, uh, when I was pretty young, so early on in my life. And so I have been going back and forth between my black family and my white family. And you know, every time I would go from one parent to the other, which was like every other week, um, it was kind of like code switching. You know, I was like in my white identity and my black identity. And so issues around race have been fundamental to my experience really early on and noticing that they were that there were differences. So fast forward. Um, when I was in nursing school, I remember uh, being in class and them talking about how obesity, diabetes, heart disease, for all of those things, being African American, being Hispanic, being Native American were risk factors. And I, I couldn't quite understand why that would be. So I raised my hand. You know, why, why is that? And my teacher at the time said, it's a genetic predisposition too. And that did not make sense to me. I don't understand how some groups of people would have these, you know, medical outcomes just based on their race and ethnicity. And then, you know, you look a little bit deeper, like for example, there's, there's a continent, you might've heard of it, it's called Africa. And there are a lot of black people in Africa and they don't have the same health outcomes as African Americans. Um, same with Mexico and you know Central America and South America. Not the same outcomes as folks who come here. So that suggests that there is something socially and politically that's happening that impacts health. And so there is one of my interests, one of the things that I'm passionate about in nursing. And the other thing is around education equity. So this is the notion that we recognize that historically in our country, things have not been equal. We know that there are groups of people who have not gotten the same level, the same quality of education as other people. And a lot of that is based on race and it's based on class. I firmly believe that everyone should have the opportunity if they want to, to number one, become a nurse or a doctor or you know any, place in healthcare that they want to be. 
And I also believe that every individual should have the opportunity to um, obtain a middle-class life and just keep it at 100% real. I love nursing. I really, really do. No regrets ever. When I made my decision to get into nursing, and I'll tell you a, a little, some other reasons why I chose nursing, but having a reliable income factored in and becoming a nurse, you know, 100% moved me out of abject poverty into a middle class life. I mean, I, you know, I remember the day I got my first nursing paycheck. And I, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much money. The first thing that I did was I went to Costco and I bought the most expensive toaster that I could find because I was sick of my toaster that I'd gotten from the thrift store that only toasted on one side, right? So that was transformational for me. So I, this is a picture, another picture of me. I am, this is my first birthday. And I just want you to know, that you know, I have titles behind my name. I have 25 years of nursing education. We all start at the beginning. Um, so you know, like the people that you see in this room, we were all new nurses at one point. We were all going through our prerequisites and struggling and wondering if we could make it. So we all have to go through that process. And if you're struggling and if it feels like hard work and what am I investing in, know that we've all been here. And we all had to go through each and every one of those steps to be successful, but we absolutely were able to do it. And I believe that you are too. So why becoming a nurse? Again, these are, these are some of the reasons that I chose nursing, but I love the idea that there's a profession where you can focus on the social sciences, like really understanding human interaction, understanding people, across the lifespan and really studying how do we communicate with people in a way that is therapeutic so that you know you establish a relationship with your patients, families, and communities, um, and also to establish trust so that individuals are um, interested in creating a care plan with you to become, you know, to achieve the best wellness that they can. So that is exciting to me. And then also the, the biological sciences human function. I, I was surprised by how much I loved anatomy and physiology, particularly physiology, which is really the study of the live dynamic body and what your different organs do and how they interact. I mean, it just, it was hard work, but deeply fulfilling work and getting to do both of those, the social sciences and the biological sciences together is, um, to me, it feels like a well-rounded picture. The other thing is the range of things that you get to do in healthcare. There's so many amazing things. And just to talk about two really important points in, in life um, is being there when somebody is born. Like, I don't know what your spiritual or religious beliefs are, but I don't think that it necessarily matters. I'm gonna tell you that in my experience, if there is a God or higher being, the moments that you can really feel those are when somebody is being born and when somebody is dying. And to be in the room while those things are happening are truly, truly magical. And then there's all those things in between that create the narrative for a patient, a family, a community. And being part of that lifespan is deeply, deeply fulfilling. And let me just say, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, there's the happiness of, of a birth, and there's also the deep sadness that comes um, when, you know, a baby is stillborn or there are problems with it. And same with the loss of a loved one, you know, those things are really, really difficult. But I'm going to argue that um, it's all about connection with people right? We, we want to connect with people. And whether that is through hardship or sharing those joyful moments, that's, that's really what is deeply fulfilling. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Inside Out. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. The moral of the story is that in order to truly have joy, you also experience sadness. Like those things have to go together. And those things will happen in nursing that you, you're going to feel 
the utmost joy and the utmost sadness. And I'm just going to share quickly a, a personal experience that I had as, as a woman and as a nurse. Um, so my first pregnancy, I lost in my second trimester. And um, it, was, it, it was absolutely devastating for me when that happened. And one of the ways that I personally cope is I didn't want to be home alone grieving. So I went back to work as soon as I was physically capable of going back to work. So interestingly, on the same day that, that I'm coming back to work, there is a patient and I was working in telemetry. So there is a patient, a woman who had a precipitous birth while she was stuck in traffic. So the baby came suddenly early and really, really fast. And, you know, by the time the paramedics got there, she had already delivered the baby and the baby died in her arms in the car. Um, so as if that's not bad enough, because of sort of the violence of the precipitous birth, she threw a clot, which landed on one of the valves of her heart, which meant that she had to have open heart surgery. So that brought her to my unit. And really nobody wanted to take care of her because, you know, it was just such a difficult, devastating case. Um, but I volunteered as somebody that was also grieving. And let me tell you that that is probably one of the saddest things that I've experienced personally. And I know for her, absolutely devastating. It almost felt like there was something predetermined, like the two of us were supposed to work together. There was no other nurse that could understand her the way that I understood her that day. And although I don't recommend doing this very often in your career, I was actually, you know, in the bed with her and we were hugging and crying at the loss of our babies, right? And so it was the deepest sadness, but it's also this piece of deep joy that I got to have that sort of connection with her. And I don't know if there are very many professions where you get to have that kind of connection with other human beings that is transformational for them and transformational for yourself. So one of the things that I want to talk about is the paradox of health. So this is really about when our values related to health are not in alignment with our health outcomes. So I know that the majority of people that I talk with that come into nursing really truly want to make a difference and do good in the world. Unfortunately, our overall outcomes as a healthcare system do not necessarily align with that. We have, you know, multiple health disparities that have gone on for, you know, centuries really and have been consistent and relatively unchanged over time. And so that means that we're working toward this thing um, called health equity. And that means that there's opportunities for us as individuals as healthcare professionals, as a system to make huge and significant changes. So I'm just gonna read this to you. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna read a ton of slides, but this is a quote from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that really resonates with me. So they talk about this thing called a culture of health, which means working together to improve health for all. It means placing well-being at the center of every aspect of our lives. In a culture of health, Americans understand that we're all in this together. No one is excluded. Everyone has access to the care they need, and all families have the opportunity to make healthier choices. In a culture of health, communities flourish and individuals thrive. So this is a goal. This is aspirational. We are not there yet, but we need to get there. And so in order to get there, there are some things that we need to understand, some competencies that we need to have to get there. I'm going to share some of those with you. Um, I, I am going to talk about systemic racism. We can also talk about this as systemic inequities. Um, and you'll see some variation of definitions of this, but this is one of the ways that I explain it. Systemic racism is made up of structural racism institutional racism, and individual racism. Um, and so we are going to, in the next few slides, look at sort of what the difference is between them and what essentially we can do about them. 
So structural racism has to do with the policies and laws and even the physical structures that define our society, many of which were conceived of and constructed during a time when it was explicit and overt goal to ensure the separation of groups and to establish the advantage of some groups over another. Um, a classic example of this is through um, the, the concept of uh, redlining. And um, redlining, you can see in the images here, the first image is of Washington, DC. This is our country's capital. Um, and if you look at the legend below, there are different colors that signify different uh, racial ethnic groups. So black folks are given the color blue, white folks red, um, Hispanic yellow. And so if we lived in a fully integrated society, when we look like at a map like this, we would not be able to see distinct colors in distinct neighborhoods. It, would, it should just be a color of brown. But if you look like, if you look at Washington DC and those surrounding areas, you can see that clearly racial and ethnic groups are living in, in separate communities. One of the things is looking at Chicago, which just always amazes me every time I look at this, you can see that you can actually cross a street and move from a white neighborhood to a black neighborhood. Now that doesn't happen by accident. That is something that was planned out and maintained over time through a process of, um, of redlining where um, areas were considered high risk investments and were considered red zones. And these were enacted by zoning laws, which uh, you know at first openly prohibited black residents from moving into white neighborhoods until that was struck down like in the early 1900s by the Supreme Court. But this was skirted by what is called restrictive covenants, which stipulated that whites could only sell property to whites. So that created exclusionary zoning and um, you know things like urban renewal, which has also been nicknamed Negro removal um, by activists because it really is, is the system which maintains that segregation. So the, the notion of gentrification is also another way to look at redlining. So <clears throat> again, these are the policies, these are the laws, these are the physical structures that are in place that perpetuate racism. So what do we do about it? One is that we recognize that it's our heritage, whether we like it or not, whether we think that this is our, our fault or responsibility, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that this is our legacy, this is our reality, and that if we're gonna change it, we need to address it. It does become, I would argue, our fault if we keep kicking it down the road to our kids and grandkids to deal with, right? So we need to be moving forward. And one of the ways that we can do this is by understanding communities that are different from our own. You probably have you know, expertise in your community, in your heritage, in your group identity, but what do you know about other groups? And, and so it is incumbent upon us to understand, to reach out and to gain some of this information. So I'm gonna talk about institutional racism. So this is what happens at the institutional level. And you can think of some of the, you know, some of the overarching institutions in our society as healthcare, education, our carceral system, employment, housing, all of those are big institutions in our country. And so I'm going to give you an example of the educational system and how institutional racism um, is allowed to thrive there. Um, so there, oops, excuse me, uh, there was a gentleman named Carl Brigham. I don't know if you know who he is, um, but he is the person that wrote and created the Scholastic Aptitude Test, otherwise known as the SAT, which whenever I ask a room full of people, how many of you taken the SAT, at least 75% of the people have taken it, or they've taken some version of a standardized exam, which is based upon this exam written by um, Carl Brigham. Um, so keeping in mind that the, the institution of SATs is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's commonly used by institutions of higher education to determine who is qualified 
who is academically capable of succeeding in, sco in school. But who was this guy and what was his jam? So Carl Brigham considered himself a scientist and the foundation of his research was eugenics, trying to prove that white people are smarter than black people or brown people. So in 1923, he wrote a vitriolic book called A Study of American Intelligence. Here's the cover of the book uh, right here. I have actually read parts of the book. Um, they're accessible from the internet. Um, and uh, it, it was difficult to read because basically every word that he wrote was racist and denigrating to non-whites, people and anyone who was marginalized at the time. So one of the excerpts from his book I have posted here, he wrote, the army mental test had proven beyond any scientific doubt that like the American Negroes, the Italians and the Jews were genetically ineducable. It would be a waste of good money even to attempt to try to give these born morons and imbeciles a good Anglo-Saxon education, let alone admit them into our fine medical, law, and engineering graduate schools. So he wrote that book three years before he put out the, um, the SAT. So it's hard not to wonder about the SAT and really the validity of it. What, what, what is it actually measuring? Is it measuring academic capability or is it measuring something else? Is it measuring um, having access to the secret sauce to test taking, which you know people pay you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars to be able to pass these exams with good scores. Right? So there's that piece of it. And does it measure what happens when the intellect of marginalized groups are questioned? So there's something called stereotype threat. It may be actually measuring stereotype threat rather than academic capability, right? And so what makes it institutional racism is that these are, it was, it's an opt-in, you know, universities don't have to require this, yet they do require it, or, you know, this is one of the things, one of the ways of getting into institutions of higher education. And so it means that it actively um, leaves people behind. It actively marginalizes groups of people so that they cannot access higher education. Um, what does institutional racism look like in healthcare? It looks like lack of access. So people can't access, whether it's because of um, inability to pay or that there are no clinics in their area. Um, also, because of the history of the way that we have treated groups of people, there is mistrust. People are scared to come get care from us because we have experimented, we have marginalized, we have ripped people from their homes in the form of, you know, uh, child protective services or pulling Native American uh, kids from their, their tribes and their families and putting them in institutions. In addition to poor quality, which means that you've somehow been able to access the healthcare system you decided to, but when you get there, the treatment that you're getting is poor. People are blaming you for your circumstances, for being poor or for being obese or um, they are deprioritizing you based on some aspect of your identity. So that results in health disparities and really a form of structural violence. You know, that when people are becoming harmed and there are these outcomes that are happening over and over that cause harm, that's called structural violence. We see this in nursing in what um, could be called an omitted history. And so, you know, when, when people talk about nursing, there are names of um, famous nurses. For example, Florence Nightingale. It's pretty hard to think about nursing without thinking of Florence Nightingale. And, you know, Florence Nightingale did amazing things. She was fundamental to nursing. Um, but she is not the only woman that made huge, important contrib contributions to nursing. Um, and, you know, when you think about the theorists and the educators, usually it's somebody who's white. We don't talk about the Black women who have contributed heavily to nursing. For example, um, most people know Sojourner Truth, but did you know that she was a nurse? Um, she was an enslaved nurse. She was forced to be a nurse, but nevertheless, she served as a nurse to the Dumont family prior to her work as an abolitionist. 
Um, Mary Seacole was actually a contemporary of Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War. And she tried to be part of Florence Nightingale's, they were called the Band of Angels, but was not accepted in because of her race. They were like, you're not, you're not qualified or worthy of being part of our group. So what Mary Sequel did is she would actually create, um, they were called, um, oh, what were they called? Now I can't remember what they were called. They were actually hotels where people would come in to recuperate from an illness where they you know, would convalesce. So basically, it was like a long-term care facility where Mary Seacole was essentially functioning as a nurse practitioner, being the primary care provider for um, people who had, were, had been veterans or whatever. Um, so she was very influential and um, had some great contributions to nursing. Harriet Tubman, she was a nurse in the Civil War. We don't hear about that very much. Um, Mary Mahoney was the first licensed black nurse who would go on to co-found the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. So there are a lot of people, I don't know if you know, Walt Whitman was actually a nurse, the poet Walt Whitman, he was a nurse in the Civil War. So there are a lot of histories that um, have been omitted. And that creates a sort of institutional racism in nursing where it is preferential to uh, white people, particularly white women. And, you know, so that means that men and people of color have a harder time seeing themselves in nursing and feel marginalized and excluded, which, you know, really they have been. Cultural racism in nursing, including stereotyping. This, um, I know that it's not huge and it's hard to get a good image of this. This is from a book. I'm not sure if it's the 2011 or the 2015 version of this book that was published by Pearson. And um, here it's just a screenshot of a page where they are talking about cultural differences in response to pain. And, you know, it's, uh, man, it's difficult to read some of these things, but let me just read a couple of um, examples of differences. Um, Arabs and Muslims prefer to be with family when in pain and may express pain more freely around family, big stereotype. Indians who follow Hindu practices believe that pain must be endured in preparation for a better life in the next cycle. Wow, that would be a good justification not to give people pain medication. Look at this. Blacks often report higher pain intensity than other cultures. So basically saying that Black people exaggerate their pain, which is interesting because there are some studies that show that many people still believe this old fictitious notion that black people don't feel pain as much as white people because of you know some difference in nerve endings. Not true, absolutely not true. They said that about babies too, that babies don't feel pain. I, yes, black people feel pain, babies feel pain. Um, but when you think of that, that black people should be feeling less of the pain intensity when they do say that they have pain, it's more likely that you're not going to believe them and think that they're um, exaggerating. Um, Jews may be vocal in demanding of assistance. Um, let's see. Hispanics may believe that pain is a form of punishment and that suffering must be endured if they are to enter heaven. Um, so just, just a lot of very intense stereotypes about groups of people that is being shown in a textbook for people to learn how to interact with other groups of people. So that's problematic. You know what else is problematic? Where does it say how white people respond to pain? It doesn't say that anywhere. I wanna know how white people respond to pain, but the fact that it's not there suggests that the way that white people experience pain, which is just a ridiculous notion to begin with, but however they experience it, is the normal way to experience pain. And let me give you one more example. Um, down here, it says, normal skin conditions are described as warm, pink, and dry. Warm, pink, and dry. Again, normalizing the skin of white people. And everything else would be an exception to the rule, right? So those are examples of institutional racism. So again, going back to that paradox in healthcare is to look at our values and make sure that they're reconciled with our outcomes. So one of the, uh, Ibram Kendi says, 
The only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it and then to dismantle it, okay? Another thing that we can do about it is we need representative and informed leadership and change. So we need representation when policies and practices are written. We need to have your voices in policies and practices. When we're deciding what needs to be researched and how to interpret that research, right? We need diversity and representation. When we're making big decisions about resource allocation, who should get the funding, who should get the, the opportunities and the resources within a community, we need to have folks that come from a diversity of backgrounds weighing in on those decisions. We also need that in, in our education. So we need to make sure that our students are diverse, our faculty are diverse, and that we're thinking very much about what it is that we're teaching and how we're teaching them. This is why we need you in nursing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about individual racism. So this is what's happening at the level of, um, of individuals or um, interactions between individuals. Um, so an, an interesting article that was written in 2016 is this one by Chapman and colleagues, and it talks about physicians and implicit bias, how doctors may unwittingly perpetuate healthcare disparities and as a nurse, I would love to say, yay, it's physicians, it's not nurses, we're great, we don't do that. But I can't say that because it's absolutely not true. In fact, we could cross out physicians and say healthcare providers. And so in this article, they say, I'm just gonna change the word physicians to healthcare providers. Healthcare providers are not immune to implicit bias. Indeed, uncertainty and time pressure surrounding the diagnostic process may promote reliance on stereotypes for efficient decision-making, right? Um, and here's the other thing is that finally, healthcare providers' vast knowledge of scientific data may create a strong belief in their personal objectivity, promoting bias in decision-making. So when we are tired, when we are stressed out, when we are dealing with multiple distractors or moral distress, it becomes easier for us to access our unconscious bias. Yet we are egotistical and narcissistic enough to believe that we're making objective decisions, even when we're not. And so that creates this really, you know, sort of horrid cycle of, um, of not interrupting this process. In 2003, in a landmark report, the Institute of Medicine concluded that bias, stereotyping, and prejudice on the part of healthcare providers may be contributing factors to healthcare disparities. So what we are asking of healthcare providers is to move from the idea of creating a culture of health seeing ourselves as central to that process. It's not the work of other people over there. It, it, it is the work of us as both individuals and as um, a healthcare profession. So how do we get from here to there? One of the ways is through diversity. Diversity is where innovation and problem solving come from. And I can't help but be drawn to Albert Einstein's statement that if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you've always got. So if we always have a healthcare system where the decisions and you know policies, practices, resource allocation, all of those things are decided upon by a homogenous group of people, we're always going to have the same outcome. We've had it consistently over time with relatively little change. So we need different kinds of thinkers to help us think about how we can do things differently. So this is not an opinion that I'm sharing with you. This is science. And one of the ways, oops, I got my, my book image in front of the title. I apologize for that. Um, this is um, cognitive diversity. So this man, Scott Page, is a mathematician and he shows through logic how diverse working groups are more productive, creative, and innovative than homogenous groups. 
and that we need this kind of problem solving to address complex healthcare issues, which we have not solved yet. Here is an image of an article title called The Science and Value of Diversity, Closing the Gaps in Our Understanding of Inclusion and Diversity. So really interesting article. Two of the main kernels from that article that I wanna share with you is that they state that diverse groups publish more frequently and are cited more often. So this is talking about the creation of um, knowledge and data and that diverse groups are better equipped to address health disparities. So I hope I'm making a case of why diversity is so important. Um, so diversity in and of itself um, is not going to, to create those processes that we need. Diversity has to be accompanied by inclusion. They go together, they're inseparable for this, for the magic to really happen. So a definition of inclusion is, is, is that it is the process by which individuals view themselves as active members of a larger community where their background, insights and contributions are valued as part of the creativity and productivity of the group. Inclusion then becomes the binding force for diversity. So this means that we want you in the nursing profession, both with your individual exp life experiences and with the backgrounds that you may have from how you've grown up and the groups that you identify with. Not only that, but we need you in the nursing profession. We need your insights and your perspectives and your say and your representation. I want you to know that you bring value to the nursing profession. So as you go through your classes, you will become qualified to apply to nursing programs and you will bring value, added value to the nursing profession and you belong in the nursing profession. And so we're here today for this whole conference to talk about your success and what that can look like. And so um, in the final part of this presentation, um, I want to talk with you about what I'm calling Peary's Pearls. So, um, I, I'm going to go through those one by one. Um, the first one is understanding that every interaction is an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, and so this can mean any of your patient interactions, but also interactions that you have with people at the grocery store or your friends or people that you meet from different backgrounds. And this is really an important part about humility um, we can get into the mindset that we know so much um, and I already know this or I already know that or I've studied this group or that group, but really we can always learn something more about a group of people or about an individual and the more you learn about differences, the more you realize and are open to the different ways that people may respond. So you can't make an assumption about a black patient or a Latinx patient or a white patient that you're caring for because that turns into stereotyping. There may be some things that you know about these groups in general, but who is the individual in there? Um, and then also it's great to humble ourselves as healthcare providers. I have found so many times that patients actually know stuff that I don't know. For example, I remember, um, emptying somebody's colostomy bag, which can be messy and unpleasant and not a very dignified experience for the patient um, to have you mucking around in that way. So there I am, you know, experienced nurse, rolling my sleeves up, making a huge mess, really. And um, the patient actually taught me some tricks about how to do a, a colostomy change, how to let the stool out of a bag without making a big giant mess. And so being open to those times when you're, you're learning as you're caring for your patients, again, that it felt like a joyful moment. Like it was kind of embarrassing that the patient knew more than I did as a nurse. It's supposed to be so knowledgeable. Yet at the same time, it felt so good to make that connection and to be present and to actually improve my practice. Um, be devoted to quality care. And so this means that you maintain your integrity. And what integrity is, essentially means is that you will do the right thing, no matter whether people are watching or not. 
whether you get credit or not, you're devoted to quality care. And so sometimes that means um, not following the common culture and bad habits that a unit has gotten into. And I'll just share another example. And I'm sharing examples of successes. I, believe me, I've made lots of mistakes. Um, but at a time before we had the automated medication machines, you had the sign out medications, which would take a few moments to do and you'd have to draw stuff up. And so people would draw up a 10 milligram syringe of um, morphine and label it. And then every time somebody needed two milligrams of morphine, you could just go in there, give them IV, IV push, stick it back in their unlocked drawer. And you know this was supposed to save time. And I was being oriented to do that on my unit. And I was like, I don't feel comfortable doing that. We've been trained that you're supposed to drop the amount you need, give it. And then you know when you need more, you gotta draw up, up again to make sure that you don't overdose somebody. And then we got to lock up medications because we do have healthcare providers who struggle with substances, right? Um, and they were just mad, mad, mad. Like Peary thinks she's better than everybody, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then at some point, the state, the Department of Health Services got wind of this and did a surprise visit. And everybody was running around freaking out. And I'm like, I'm having, a, my day is fine. I'm not worried at all about anybody finding out that I do that because I don't, right? Um, and that was an example of, you know, not going along with the culture um, and being devoted to quality of care rather than trying to fit in. And that, that is a hard place to be in, but that's what we do as nurses. And I don't mean then that you need to always say that you're right and think that what you're doing is right. You need to very much be open to moments when you're wrong and you need to rethink what you're doing. Um, but also that idea of integrity, that we have rules in place to help keep us safe and to help keep patients safe. Believe your patients. Um, this one, again, I just can't tell you how many times I have messed up by thinking that I knew better than a patient knew. Um, from you know things simply around pain, you know where you minimize somebody's pain, you minimize their pain, and oh look at that, they have a broken back. <laughs> to um, you're not gonna be able to start an IV in that spot. That spot, people always go to that vein to try to start the IV and it always rolls. I actually have had that happen to me as a nurse where people have said that and I learned to believe them. And I actually have a spot on my hand that I don't know why nurses always go for the spot on my hand. And I'll tell them, you know, I've had some of the, the nursing greats try to start an IV right here. You're not gonna get it, it blows every time. And they think, oh no, not me, not me. And then they blow it and it hurts for like a week. And then they're so stressed out because they didn't believe me that they have to go get somebody else to start an IV. And then I've been poked like three or four times by the time they get an IV. So believe your patients, they do know their bodies. They do bring in knowledge about who they are and how their body works. Um, and you know, this can get difficult when you have people that are seeking pain medications be to fulfill their addiction. Um, but your patients do need that medication. And it doesn't mean we're going to give them that medication, but there is something that's happening for them. They do have a need, which is that their substance issues need to be addressed, right? So you got to believe that there's something happening with your patients. Healthcare is not a competition. And I don't know how we get into this competition um, between ourselves. Like I've, I, I remember doing it in nursing school. I remember I see it uh, among cohorts of students, but it's not a competition. How can you possibly compete with somebody who has different skill sets, different talents and strengths, different background than you? I kind of feel like the only person that I could really, really compete with is myself because no, nobody else has the same traits that I have. So I am the person that I compete with. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna compete with Carter Todd around charm and ability to get people together. That is his magic power. How am I, how am I possibly gonna compete with that, right? And nor should I. What I wanna do is I wanna work with somebody that has that kind of brilliance and think about what talents can I bring to, the group or to a partnership 
that make us collectively stronger. And our overall outcome, right, is caring for patients and families and communities. So if we're so busy competing with each other, we're now focusing mostly on ourselves, a little bit on somebody else, and not really focusing as much on the process of providing excellent care to other people. We need each other. And you will find faults and weaknesses in other care providers in groups of people, but that's an easy skill. Finding the faults in other people, that takes very, very little talent. Recognizing the strength and how other people can contribute to a group, now that is a talent. And that's something that's really important to help us provide better care. Um, <clears throat> studying smarter, not harder is something that I can't emphasize enough to students. Um, I see students who sometimes doubt their capability, wonder if they're good enough to be a nurse or to be in healthcare. And in that stress and anxiety, they try to study harder and harder. So you read the same textbook, you try to read it. Well, I read it twice, I didn't get it. Now I'm gonna read it five times. I stayed up till midnight last night, I didn't get it. I'm gonna stay up till three o'clock in the morning. That's called studying harder. And that's not gonna get you the outcome that you want. What you have to do is study smarter. And what I mean by studying smarter is getting a sense of who you are as a learner. Again, we talked about everybody has different talents, personality traits, those sorts of things. So how does your body work and how does your learning work? Let me give you some examples just of what I've realized about myself. One, I function and learn much better in the morning. I can basically learn very little in the evening. That's time when I need to rest and restore. So if I really need to study, I need to get a really good night's sleep and get up early and I can have a really, really productive morning. Um, I can't just sit there and read a textbook. I am a fast reader. I am a really good reader. I am super smart. And as soon as I start reading the textbook, my head bonks down and I want to take a nap. So I have changed that so that when I look at a textbook, I look at all the visuals that are there. And I'm much more of a visual learner. So I like to look at the visual that's there, try to make sense of it, and go back to the text to help me explain those big bulleted pieces and go back. And then I write down what I've learned in my own words so that I can understand it. I'm not going to write down the word beta adrenergic. How, unless I, unless I have that word memorized, instead, I'm going to actually write down what that means, right? What is the definition of that? Write it in English for yourself so that you actually learn the concept around it. And then you can get the word that fits with the concept. Um, so it's going to be different for you. Some of you may function better at night. Some of you might like to listen to lectures over and over. You need to think about what's right for you. Um, I also need time to study by myself before I listen to other people talking about how they've learned a concept. Otherwise, I'll doubt myself. So I would actually study to go to study group, right? So just some ideas for you. Our paths to success are different. Again, this is about not competing with and not comparing yourselves to others. Um, some people are going to make it to... Uh, the end of their program in one try. Some people are gonna make it uh, after a couple tries. I will, I've been very open about the time, uh, the first time I took a college chemistry class, I got a big stink and F in that class. I studied hard, I worked hard, I got an F in the class um, and I was devastated by it. And it, it meant that I had to start school, nursing school a year later as I retook that class. I retook the class, got an A, um, started this program a year later and, you know, 25 years later, it doesn't make any difference that I started a year later, right? That was my path. I needed to hear some of those concepts over so that I could do very well in that class, right? And that's okay. Your well-being is a priority, and this has been mentioned in the new, um, I'm just looking for the book, I usually have it right next to me, the new Future of Nursing 2020-2030 report. We already knew, but it became crystal, crystal clear um, in the COVID-19 pandemic that, you know, is both historic and ongoing, that 
nurses are not an infinite pool of well-being and strength. Um, we can we see physical well-being as an issue that nurses become exhausted, depleted. Um, this can cause you back problems, migraines, malnutrition, obesity, all of these different things where your body is stressed out and trying to cope with um, that level of stress. There's also the mental emotional piece. Um, it is hard to watch people suffering, to be in the midst of their suffering. It's particularly hard right now when you're seeing people um, dying on ventilators, people that are both vaccinated and unvaccinated, um, becoming deeply, deeply ill with something that is preventable. And a lot of nurses are just like, forget this. Why am I putting my physical and mental emotional well being on the line day after day for people that are not looking out for me as well? Um, moral and spiritual well being. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we are stuck making moral and ethical decisions that there's just no right or wrong answer. There's no right way to proceed. There is a way to proceed. And no matter which direction you take, you always wonder if the other way could have been better, right? So we need to care for ourselves in that way. And then also our social well-being, your relationships with your family, your friends, with your community are really, really important. Um, and so this means that you have to prioritize this. You can't take good care of patients if you are suffering in any of these domains, right? We talked about if you are stressed out or distracted, and again, in any of these domains, you're more likely to access your un unconscious bias and cope in ways that um, impede your ability to make good clinical, good, equitable, and fair clinical decisions about the patients that you care for. So it is okay to prioritize your well-being and however that looks for you. That can be different for different people. It may be exercise. It may be reading a book. It may be, you know, hanging out with your dog or with your kids or whatever, but your well-being is a priority. And then um, my Last slide for you is just a reminder that you got this. It's hard. It seems like it could be impossible, but people do it. It takes practice. All of us started at the beginning um, and it's gonna be a journey for you. And I'd like to welcome you on this journey. And I am going to stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ackerman Barger, for the wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, do we have just a few minutes um, for questions? Are you willing to take any questions, Fred? Absolutely. Questions, comments, reactions. I love hearing from people. Yes. You want to put? If you'd like to raise your hand, I'll, I can allow you to um, to uh, share to speak and share your questions if you like, or if you feel more comfortable, um, you could just type it in the chat. in a few minutes. A lot of feedback, it looks like. Phenomenal, thank you. Amazing presentation. I'll just give it another minute or so. And if we don't have any questions, then I will end a little bit early. That way we have some time for everyone to take a break. Um, and then we can go on um to set up our breakout rooms so again i will post a, a link to the chat or to the uh, schedule uh, where you can find the schedule for for the breakout rooms they're each on different um zoom they're set up for different zoom meetings so yes it looks like all right perfect so again thank you so much um for the wonderful presentation um, if everyone could just show, show some love for Dr. Ackerman Barger uh, in the chat, um, she always does an amazing job. Um, as I mentioned before, she served as my thesis chair, and I mean, wow, like I learned so much. She would sit uh, with me and refer to articles and books and recall the author and the title and the year. And I'm just going to be honest, I struggled to put together a reference page for a long time, so I don't even know how she did that. So <laughs> I could recall most episodes of Martin, but you know, even I have some limits there. 
Um, so I'm, I'm just learning and it's just been a pleasure to just sit with her and have discussions. And if I can add like five more quarters onto my master's program, I would just to meet with her. Um, and so for